A Thousand Miles Up the Nile, Section 39. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Thousand Miles Up the Nile by Amelia B. Edwards. Chapter 13. Philae to Carrasco, Part 3. Meanwhile, on we go, starting at sunrise, mooring at sunset, sailing, tracking, punting, never stopping for an hour by day, if we can help it, and pushing straight for Abu Simbel with as little delay as possible. Thus we pass the pylons of Debod with their background of desert. Gertas, a miniature sunium, seen towards evening against the glowing sunset. Tafa, rich in palms, with white columns gleaming through green foliage by the waterside. The cliffs, islands, and rapids of Kalabsha, and the huge temple which rises like a fortress in their midst. Dender, a tiny chapel with a single pylon, and Gerf Hussein, which from this distance might be taken for the mouth of a rock-cut tomb in the face of the precipice. About halfway between Kalabsha and Dender, we enter the Tropic of Cancer. From this day till the day when we repass that invisible boundary, there is a marked change in the atmospheric conditions under which we live. The days get gradually hotter, especially at noon, when the sun is almost vertical, but the freshness of night and the chill of early morning are no more. Unless a strong wind blows from the north, we no longer know what it is to need a shawl on deck in the evening, or an extra covering on our beds towards dawn. We sleep with our cabin windows open, and enjoy a delicious equality of temperature from sundown to sunrise. The days and nights, too, are of almost equal length. Now also the Southern Cross and a second group of stars, which we conclude must form part of the centaur, are visible between two and four every morning. They have been creeping up a star at a time for the last fortnight, but are still so low upon the eastern horizon that we can only see them when there comes a break in the mountain chain on that side of the river. At the same time, our old familiar friends of the northern hemisphere, looking strangely distorted and out of their proper place, are fast disappearing on the opposite side of the heavens. Orion seems to be lying on his back, and the great bear to be standing on his tail, <clears throat> while Cassiopeia and a number of others have deserted en masse. The zenith, meanwhile, is but thinly furnished, so that we seem to have traveled away from the one hemisphere, and not yet to have reached the other. As for the Southern Cross, we reserve our opinion till we get farther south. It would be treason to hint that we are disappointed in so famous a constellation. After Gerf Hossein, the next place of importance for which our maps bid us look out is Dhaka. As we draw near, expecting hourly to see something of the temple, the Nile increases in breadth and beauty. It is a peaceful, glassy morning. The men have been tracking since dawn, and stopped to breakfast at the foot of a sandy bank, wooded with tamarisks and gum trees. A glistening network of gossamer floats from bow to bow. The sky overhead is of a tender luminous blue, such as we never see in Europe. The air is wonderfully still. The river, which here takes a sudden bend towards the east, looks like a lake, and seems to be barred ahead by the desert. Presently a funeral passes along the opposite bank, the chief mourner flourishing a long staff like a drum major, the women snatching up handfuls of dust and scattering it upon their heads. We hear their wild wail long after the procession is out of sight. Going on again presently, our whole attention becomes absorbed by the new and singular geological features of the Libyan desert. A vast plain covered with isolated mountains of volcanic structure, it looks like some strange transformation of the Puy de Dome plateau, with all its wind-swept pastures turned to sand, and its grassy craters stripped to barrenness. The more this plain widens out before our eyes, the more it bristles with peaks. As we round the corner, and Dhaka, like a smaller Edfu, comes into sight upon the western bank, the whole desert on that side, as far as the eye can see, presents the unmistakable aspect of one vast field of volcanoes. As in Auvergne, these cones are of all sizes and heights, some low and rounded, like mere bubbles that have cooled without bursting, others ranging, apparently, from 1,000 to 1,500 feet in height. The broken craters of several are plainly distinguishable by the help of a field glass. 
One in particular is so like our old friend the Puy de Perot that in a mere black and white sketch the one might readily be mistaken for the other. We were surprised to find no account of the geology of this district in any of our books. Marie and Wilkinson pass it in silence, and writers of travels, one or two of whom notice only the pyramidal shape of the hills, are for the most part content to do likewise. None seem to have observed their obvious volcanic origin. Thanks to a light breeze springing up in the afternoon, we were able to hoist our big sail again and to relieve the men from tracking. Thus we glided past the ruins of Maharaka, which, seen from the river, looked like a Greek portico set in a hollow waste of burning desert. Next came Wadi Sabua, a temple half buried in sand, near which we met a tiny Dahabia manned by two Nubians and flying the star and crescent. A shabby government inspector in European dress and a fez lay smoking on a mat outside his cabin door, while from a spar overhead there hung a mighty crocodile. This monster was of a greenish-brown color and measured at least sixteen feet from head to tail. His jaws yawned, and one flat and flabby arm and ponderous paw swung with the motion of the boat, looking horribly human. The painter, with an eye to foregrounds, made a bid for him on the spot, but the shabby inspector was not to be moved by considerations of gain. He preferred his crocodile to infidel gold, and scarcely deigned even to reply to the offer. Seen in the half-light of a tropical afterglow, the purple mountains coming down in detached masses to the water's edge on the one side, the desert with its volcanic peaks yet rosy upon the other, we thought the approach to Carrasco more picturesque than anything we had yet seen south of the cataract. As the dusk deepened, the moon rose, and the palms that had just room to grow between the mountains and the river turned from bronze to silver. It was half twilight, half moonlight, by the time we reached the mooring place, where Ptolemy, who had been sent forward in the small boat half an hour ago, jumped on board laden with a packet of letters and a sheaf of newspapers. For here, where the great caravan route leads off across the desert to Khartoum, we touched the first Nubian post office. It was only ten days since we had received our last budget at Aswan, but it seemed like ten weeks. End of section 39